The encounter with the Moabites in chapters 22 and 24 is extremely interesting for a number of reasons. Here, Balak, the son of Zippor of Moab, is aware of the Israelites coming, and he hires a seer named Balaam, son of, the son of Beor, to curse the Israelites. And Balaam says to Balak, Stay here tonight, and I will bring back word to you, just as the Lord speaks to me. Balaam goes with the messengers of Balak, but is blocked by a messenger, an angel of Yahweh, whom he does not see, but his donkey does. Balaam ends up blessing Israel instead of cursing. And this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise of land made in Genesis 12, etc. This whole account is to show that Yahweh is Lord of the nations and can work through a non-Israelite prophet and even a donkey. What's really interesting is that in Jordan, at a place called Derala, there was found this particular plaster inscription written with ink. And in it, it recounts the misfortunes of the book of Balaam, son of Beor. A divine seer was he. Now this inscription was written long after the events and numbers could have occurred. But it is possible that in this inscription it is looking back on a very famous prophet. This inscription actually does not make any reference to Israel. And it is very difficult to read because it is so fragmentary. And you can see here part of what is going on according to one translation in this inscription where Balaam has a vision according with El's utterance and all he has received in the vision is destruction. I happen to be part of the group that photographed this in Jordan in 2002. But getting back to this Balaam son of Beor, in Numbers, when he prophesies to Balak, he says, Listen to me, O son of Zippor. God is not a human being that he should lie, or a mortal that he should change his mind. Has he promised, and will he not do it? Has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? See, I received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, acclaimed as a king among them. God, who brings them out of Egypt, is like the horns of a wild ox for them. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, See what God has done. Look, a people rising up like a lioness, and rousing itself like a lion. It does not lie down until it has eaten the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. Another very interesting prophecy of Balaam has to do with verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the borderlands of Moab and the territory of all the Shethites. This seems to be referring to the kingship in later Judah, perhaps Israel.
A particularly interesting passage concerns the daughters of Zelophehad. This follows the census of the clans of Israelites in chapter 26. Now normally what happened is that inheritance was counted through the sons. But Moses is brought a particular case. And this reflects one of the functions of Moses and others whom he has appointed, such as the priests and the leaders. Then the daughters of Zelophehad came forward. Zelophehad was son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Machir, son of Manasseh, son of Joseph, a member of the Man uh, Manassite clans. The names of his daughters were Mahla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. They stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they said, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among the company of those who, who gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died for his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be taken away from his clan, because he had no son? Give to us a possession among our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad are right in what they are saying. You shall indeed let them possess an inheritance among their father's brothers and pass the inheritance of their father on to them. You shall also say to the Israelites, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall pass his inheritance on to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the nearest kinsman of his clan, and he shall possess it. It shall be for the Israelites a statute and ordinance, as the Lord commanded Moses. So as with Leveret marriage, the concern here is that the name of someone not be lost from Israel. And so therefore, that clan, that name, that tribe can be carried on through the line of the daughter if there are no sons. Earlier in the book of Numbers, Moses is told that he will not enter the promised land. This is due to his frustration and lack of trust in striking the rock twice in order to get water. So it becomes then important to appoint a successor, someone who can carry on, especially once the people enter the land. And so it is in the book of Numbers that Joshua is appointed the successor of Moses. Joshua, son of Nun, was one of those who believed that Israel could overcome the people of Canaan, and he did not complain but was faithful. It is also said that he, that he is a man in whom is the Spirit. So therefore, Moses lays hands on him and commissions him to be Moses' successor. And we will see Joshua later on.